In today's episode, we find the birthplace of an F1 legend, solve a half century old, rather disturbing mystery, and enjoy our first thrilling drive on Scotland's winding roads. Enjoy. In Scotland, and having to apply sun cream. Have you ever heard of anything so absurd? Okay, so we're off somewhere. Welcome to day two, by the way. So one of the things that we've realized, we're having so much stuff in this car. Richard, I am locked out of the car. Thank you. Enter. Is in order for me to fit in with all the stuff on me, the process goes, Hanrich of the massive bag. Hanrich of the camera. Climbing. This is always entertaining. Although it's good so with, the the roof, roof. with the roof off, it's just like a little, nice little walk down. Easy, so graceful. Disappointing with how graceful you were. Thank you. I aim to disappoint. Uh, back, back. And then camera. All oh, right. And then camera back and ready to rock and roll. The afternoon's journey was one of historical discovery. After spending the morning driving across half the UK and then drag racing, we were after something entirely different. Well, not entirely, as first we were back in the car for a two and a half hour motorway drive to a village called Milton, which is situated on a busy road just a few miles outside of Glasgow. It wasn't prime VX220 territory, but I was on the lookout for something specific. Found what I wanted. Now let me show you what I wanted to find. Okay, so why have we stopped at an auto dealership on the side of a busy road just outside of Glasgow? For a very good reason, because to Formula One fans, this place should be holy ground. You see that house right there? You see the blue plaque? That's the birthplace of a motoring legend, a racer, a record breaker, and possibly one of the most important people in the history of Formula One, Sir Jackie Stewart. I'm gonna take 10 minutes and tell you about him. Uh, no, five minutes if you don't mind. So you got somewhere better to be? Actually, yes. There's something around the corner I wanna show you. I'm gonna take five minutes and tell you about him. That's okay. Thanks. Five minutes isn't enough time to cover the life of a man like Sir Jackie Stewart. So instead, I'm going to focus on just one aspect of his life so far. The racing. And to do that, all I really need to do is talk about the 4th of August, 1968. But quickly, here's how he got there. Sir Jackie Stewart was a talented sportsman. Before cars, he was on the Scottish national shooting team and won championships for his country. But it was when he was put in a car that his prowess really showed, and immediately so. After winning some races in sports car racing, he was quickly offered a go at testing a Tyrrell Formula 3 car. It was his first time in the car and he was testing next to Bruce McLaren, as in McLaren F1 team Bruce McLaren. So not much was expected of Mr. Stewart. But within a couple of laps, Jackie was already beating McLaren's time in the identical car. This annoyed McLaren, who went back out to improve his time, yet Stewart blitzed those times too. He was offered a spot on the Formula 3 team right away, and in his very first race, he destroyed the competition. Within two laps of his first race, which incidentally took place in the pouring rain, he was 25 seconds ahead, and he finished the race with a 44 second gap to second place. Within just days of his very first race, he was offered a spot on the Cooper F1 team. However, he actually refused. He knew he was young and felt he had much still to learn in Formula 3. 
but F1 wanted him, and he couldn't refuse for long, so after dominating the Formula 3 championship, he moved up to the big leagues to make his mark. Did he succeed? Well all we need to look at is one race. Actually we just need to look at one lap, a single lap of the Nürburgring Nordschleife. It's time to talk about the 4th of August 1968. On this day a race went ahead that really shouldn't have. The conditions were terrible. Fog and torrential rain had smothered the circuit all weekend to the point where there were rivers crossing the track and just months after his close friend and fellow Scotsman Jim Clark had been killed on Germany's less dangerous circuit, Hockenheim, Stewart was lining up on the grid in 6th place, forced to do so by his team boss despite his concerns for how unsafe the race was. When racing in Formula 1 in the rain, it's well known that the safest place to be is at the front, and whether for the want to win or the want to simply survive, Jackie Stewart decided that he needed to get to the front, fast. The lights turned green and accelerators were buried into the floor, and thus began a heroic lap. Pole sitter Jackie Ix fumbled the start and quickly fell back, behind Stewart. One down. Within 100 metres, Stewart had out-accelerated Vic Elford's Cooper BRM. That's two down. Then, under braking for the first corner, Jackie managed to slip his mantra forward past the Brabham of Jochen Rintz. Three down, two to go. Before the first half of the lap was completed, he was lining up to overtake the Ferrari of Chris Amon. Conditions were so treacherous, he couldn't see the car ahead. He only knew he was getting close because the amount of spray pounding into his visor was intensifying. Stewart says that as he pulled out to pass the Ferrari, he was driving completely blind. But he made the pass stick, with no collision, which is also a testament to Amon's ability as well as Stewart's. That's four down, just one overtake to go, and it was the big one. The championship leader, Lotus driver Graham Hill. The two cars passed the walls of spectators who turned up to see the race, and then disappeared into a dense fog. TV cameras eagerly waited on the start-finish straight to see who would end the lap ahead. And then, out of a sea of blinding grey, emerges Jackie Stewart. He started his second lap before Hill could even be seen. In fact, Stewart was already 9 seconds ahead of the Lotus. A lap later, he was 34 seconds ahead, and when he finally finished the gruelling Grand Prix, he was 4 minutes and 3 seconds clear of his nearest competitor. This race alone cemented Sir Jackie Stewart as one of the sport's most unforgettable drivers, who gave the sport one of its most unforgettable drives. After this race, Stewart went on to win a record-setting 27 races in his F1 career a feat that was only bettered 14 years later by Alan Prost. He also won three world championships. Some legends are born in a moment, others over decades. So Jackie Stewart was born here, in a modest house next to his dad's car dealership. But his legend, that came almost 30 years later and was born at the Green Hell. Okay, let's go. Oh wait, you need to drive. Yeah. You know where you're going. Of course. Richard's discovery had nothing to do with cars, but it does make good pub knowledge. Plus it was only five minutes up the road. What is this? So this is a bridge, yes. but not just any bridge, it's a special one. It is the dog suicide bridge. It's actually a thing. Dog suicide bridge. It's a big thing. It's a big thing. <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> For dogs. Yeah. Right, tell us all about it. So Graham, we're here at the Overton Bridge, also known as the Dog Suicide Bridge. And this is the Bermuda Triangle for dogs. Dogs come here and disappear. They do crazy things. They jump off the side, sometimes to their death. Sometimes they jump off, survive, run back up and jump off again. I've got three theories of why this is the case. <laughs> right, Sherlock Holmes, let's do this. Right, come with me. I have an assistant, but don't worry, we have a lead for him so he'll be safe. Theory one is all about nuclear submarines. You see, there's a nuclear submarine base just two or three miles down the road. And 
People believe that the high emitted frequencies from these submarines cause the dogs to go wild. And then, when they're on this bridge, they can't take it anymore, and they just jump. Okay. No! <laughs> it's all right, I've got him. He's safe. Come on, lad. <laughs> okay. However, Graham, this theory doesn't work with me. I've looked into it, and you see, dogs started jumping off this bridge before the nuclear submarine base. 15 years, in fact. So therefore, we can rule this theory out. Come with me to theory two. Okay, I shall. So as you can see, this bridge, the architecture on it is quite striking. It has symmetrical turrets and people believe that these symmetrical turrets actually are almost like an optical illusion for the dogs. They, they believe jumping from the floor onto the turret, they're jumping onto a different level. And obviously when they jump off, there's no other level to go up to. <laughs> However, this theory doesn't work with me either because dogs come in all shapes and sizes. You've got very little dogs, but you've also got big dogs. So they're not all gonna see the same thing and therefore they're not all gonna see this optical illusion. Theory two is out the window. Finally, theory three, and I believe we've got it. You see, in my investigations, I found that only dogs with a long snout have been jumping off the bridge. And this led me to think that there must be a smell in the air that only dogs with a sharp sense of smell can detect. So, with a bit of research, I discovered that mink had been released into the area in the 1950s. And shortly after this was when all the dogs started jumping off. Therefore, I can conclude that the smell of mink is making these dogs jump off. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a word part, but we will take it. Holmes, you have cracked the case. Excellent. I actually really enjoyed that. That was great. Well done. Thank well, you. Well presented. High quality dog suicide bridge. Um, but it was a bit of a word part at the end, wasn't it? No, it was great, it was great. Definitely. Do you know what I've realised though? So when we've been filming this... Yeah. Like, no one does take their dogger over here. Oh, but oh, then yeah. a couple of like I saw like someone bringing like a pug over, which yeah. is, suits your snout theory. Yeah. Otherwise, everyone's always going, their dogs, kind of up that way now. Or I saw people similarly just doing that. No one brings their dogs over, over here. The bridge, yeah. So people genuinely freak out about it. Yeah. It's a thing. It's a real thing. It is a thing. Yeah. yeah. That's badass. All right. Back to the car. Back to the car. Come on, Watson. Let's go. Uh... And I can take this out. Yes. Right. Onwards. Next stop, campsite. Yeah. <laughs> right, let's hope we can get a pitch. I did the calculations. 506 miles we've covered today. No, don't even think about it. I'm going in the dinghy. <laughs> Look at this for our view. It's nice that the car's got the view as well. I think she deserves it. End of the day here. Ten hours later. <laughs> Ten hours of sleep. Onwards we go. Yes. On the second day of our trip, we had a single task. We were supercar hunting, but not for McLarens or Ferraris. We were on the search for something Scottish, and in order to find it, we had to get off the mainland. So first, we had to drive to a port on the west coast, to then get onto a ferry, cross to the Isle of Mull, 
and then drive to a farm in the middle of nowhere. However, as soon as I booted up the GPS, I realised we'd made something of a miscalculation. First drive of the day and we are stuck in Scottish traffic. We're supposed to be at the ferry terminal in an hour and a half and it's saying an hour and 50 minutes until we get there. Could be a problem. It was a problem. If we were able to keep up a decent speed, we would make it to the ferry with time to spare. However, the A82 is as busy as it is beautiful, and we spent the vast majority of our time on it stuck behind slow traffic. I'd resigned us to missing our ferry. However, once we turned off that wretched road, the traffic dispersed and Richard made a run for it. He had 40 minutes to complete 60 minutes worth of driving. Fortunately, we were in the perfect car for the job. The drive was mighty, and it had taken us from being very late to just a little late. We were actually in with a shot of making it. Have I got anything else after this? Oh. Dead flies. We made it before the ferries left, but they've told us that we're like a low priority because we're late. Do you think we're getting in? We're in a queue, so I'm confident you, at the moment. Did you just kind of sneak into this queue? I think so. <laughs> I was directed here but I snuck through two barriers to get in to this area so... Hey if it works out it works out. Exactly. It didn't work out. That's our car. That's the boat going. We missed it. Thanks for watching episode 2. Tune in tomorrow to find out whether we make it onto the next ferry, whether we get lost on the other side, or whether we even manage to find a Scottish supercar. In the meantime, please do consider subscribing to my channel should you want to be kept up to date with my newest videos. Thanks.